What's up everybody? I'm Cecilia the Mess from the Game Plan Educational Solutions. Today we're going to be talking about standardized testing in the time of online learning. If you are just as frustrated about even having to have this conversation as I am, make sure you hit the like button, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and make sure you hit that notification bell so that you know exactly when our next video drops. So, if you want to know a little bit more about what we need to do to prepare our students should this nightmare continue, then keep on watching. Okay, so as you all heard, I am completely dismayed that we're even having to have this conversation. And the fact of the matter is, because I've spent you know, over a decade of my life as an educator, I, I know how taxing it is on our mental health, on our students' mental health, on our emotional well-being. And although I'm really crossing all my fingers and toes and hoping that they don't move forward with standardized testing this year, I'm also the type of teacher that I'd rather know and you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best than be caught, you know, off guard last minute. So, you know, for all the bells and whistles that our campuses and our districts sometimes want us to implement to get those scores to, you know, increase and to get our students to be successful in standardized testing, there's only three main things that you really need to focus on if you want to move the needle when it comes to test scores. So stay tuned as I walk you through my top three strategies for preparing your students while teaching online. Okay, so the first strategy deals with intentional planning. And I started with intentional planning because it really is the most important factor in creating lessons that convert into results. If your foundation's not good, the outcome will also not be good. So for example, when we look at our state standards, it literally tells us what our students need to know. It provides us with a verb. Now this verb tells us, does our student need to identify? Does the student need to analyze? Does the student need to know cause and effect, etc.? So what you wanna do is when you plan, you wanna make sure that you plan in a way that addresses that particular verbiage, that particular expectation. If not, you're wasting your time, you're working harder than you have to, and more often than not, your students are gonna feel like you didn't prepare them for this test, right? They're gonna go into panic mode when they see questions that are at a different depth level than they were expecting. So when we plan, this is like the most important foundation for you know, preparing for standardized, te standardized testing. When we plan, you wanna make sure that you plan with intention. In other words, if your students are only going to be asked to identify certain historical figures, you wanna make sure that any activity that you plan in your class actually prompts them and provides them with opportunities to identify those historical figures. This is also another big reason why sometimes teachers burn out is because they're trying to go in depth into every single topic when that's not what the learning standard is requesting of the instructor and of the student. If you know it's identify, then you'll have something like sorting cards, like matching, um, like a co cooperative learning game where students, again, are just recalling information or identifying. So being intentional with planning will give you that efficiency, will give you those results because if your students can master that verbiage, if they can master that action, that expectation, you know they'll be able to perform that same way on the test. Now here's the deal. You wanna make sure that the graphics, that the visuals, that the wording, that the phrases that you use within those class exercises also reflect how the students are taught. So you definitely want to look into some of these tests, uh, your standardized test or release test or your own class assessment if you are writing your own tests and see what wording, what vocabulary you'll be using and get students familiar with that and embed that into your activities, into your lessons so students are not mortified and horrified the minute they start seeing um, unfamiliar content on the test. The second thing you want to look at is engagement. Clearly my dog's very engaged right now. So when it comes to engagement, it's always important to remember that if your students don't find the topic 
interesting. If you do not hook your learners and if they do not feel liked by you, they are not going to pay attention to you, which means that it's going to be so much more challenging to get them to remember the content. So when we're trying to um, create engagement for our students, you can do things like visuals, building relationship with your students. You can utilize instructional games for both team building and for building relationships with your students. Um, you can create student-centered learning activities as a means to engage them because in that type of classroom, they're out front and center. Like they have no choice but to, you know, participate. You can also utilize some of my favorite strategies for teaching, which are direct teaching strategies. If you're curious about learning more, a little bit more about direct teaching strategies and how I use this in my instruction, I will link the video on the lost art of direct teaching up above and also down below. And if you want a few more strategies for how to hook your learners from the start of your lesson, I will also link that video up above and down below for you to check out. So, so far, does this resonate with you? Let me know which of these strategies you've also used to keep engagement high in your own classroom. One of my personal favorite strategies for getting my students engaged and keeping my students hooked on my lesson is historical storytelling, which is also another way of helping my students to repeat and remember content. So one of the final strategies that you need to consider when planning, when preparing your students for standardized testing is repetition. Now, this isn't the type of mindless repetition that bores your students out of their minds and really gets them demotivated to participate in class. I'm talking about intentional repetition. So a long time ago when I was in karate, my karate instructor used to tell me that there was a million ways to disguise the same exercise, the same movement. Uh, the same motion and to get students to practice it and I could really relate to that as a teacher because I was like that's what I need to be doing so that things will stick because again if we repeat it our brain starts to assimilate the fact that this is some important information and that perchance we need to focus on it right because they've heard it a thousand times the way it applies to our classrooms is something I like to call looping and so when we loop information we are basically doing a very discreet product placement if you will of our content vocabulary words our um, important historical events important historical figures etc so you find places to embed this throughout now i'm going to be honest with you a more seasoned teacher can probably do this at the drop of a hat and just without thinking of it too much but if you are a newer history teacher, you probably want to make the time to think about where you're going to embed this in your lesson. So when you plan, so this goes back to the foundation that we talked about, when you plan, you want to make sure that you plan for places where you can be looping this information continuously so that your students not only hear it over and over, but they get a chance to actually use and apply whatever they learned from the start and continue to implement it and see that everything in history ties together. Historical events are not in isolation. And so when they're able to connect the dots and see the big picture, um, again, it'll make more sense to them, which will help them retain the information. And as far as being strategic and engaging, you can embed repeated material in entrance tickets, in exit tickets, in class review games, in your warm-ups, in your bell work, in cooperative learning stations, um, in walking galleries. You can pretty much embed that content in anything as long as you're making a reference back to it or you're asking your students to utilize their prior knowledge to resolve or respond to the new task at hand. Ideally, the best form of repetition would be one in which you get your students to actually teach this information to others. So that could be in the form of a skit or a presentation because if they teach it, they internalize it and they know it. Now, if you're not one to spend hours and hours planning, and if you find yourself really short on time this year, then you may want to consider visiting my pre-made resources at the History Hub, and the link is down below. These resources are pre-linked, and they are ready to go for synchronous, asynchronous settings, or even in-person settings. And I really hope that that saves you a little bit of time and um, eases some of the weight of 
planning for your lessons during the school year. Please consider subscribing so that I can continue to bring content that you enjoy and that you find useful. So as always, I hope you have a fantastic day. Until next time, class dismissed.